Now, in order to have any measure of success in your fight, you have to know who your foe is. You have to know who your enemy is. Now, let me ask this question. Do you want to defeat your foe? Now, that's rhetorical. Everybody, nobody wants to enter, uh, begin a day uh, hoping that they fail. Nobody does that. Everybody wants to succeed. Everybody wants to, wants to be productive every single day. You want to win every challenge that comes your way every single day. So it's a rhetorical question. But in order for us to move forward and to, to recognize our enemy, we must know who our enemy is. Now, I know many times, many times, we think our enemy or our foe is that person who, who did something hurtful to you, that person that might have said something that was not altogether true about you, uh, might be a situation that's, you know, that's, that's, that's got you where you can't, you, you, you can't, you don't know which way to go. So those people are not your enemy. I don't care what they did, what they said, how they hurt you, how negatively you might feel towards them. They are not your enemy. Let's hear who God says our enemy is. In Luke Jesus said, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. So Jesus is saying that Satan is the one who's on your track. He's the one that's on your trail. He's the one that's asked the Lord, that he may break you up, that he may cause you to, to fall apart. He's the one, not the person that said that thing that, that offended you. No, not that person who you think did something that was not altogether right. Uh, you know, no, it's, it's, the, it's the enemy. It's Satan. He's the one that's, that's his, his whole job is to steal, to kill, and to destroy everything about you and your relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay, now God also told us through the pen of Peter, he said to be vigilant, be sober. In other words, be sober, be balanced. Don't get too high, don't get too low. Just keep things at a kind of even keel. Be sober, be vigilant. In other words, pay attention. Look and see what's going on around and about you. Somebody is trying to get you, okay? Because your adversary and in case you don't know who it is, God tells us the devil, he walks about like a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. He wants to eat you up. He wants to chew you up and spit you out. That's what he wants to do. That's your enemy. God tells us, don't fear the one that can destroy your body. Fear the one that can destroy your body and your soul. Praise God. So... And that one, that one, that one, that the only one that can do that, praise God, is our king himself. So here we are. Now we know who our foe is. Now we know our foe is not that person who you've been plotting on, trying to get even with, trying to set the record straight with. You're trying to figure out how to give him a piece of him or her, a piece of your mind. Not that one. Not that one. It's the devil. So now that we know who our foe is, we're going to get into it. We're going to ask the question now, how badly do you want to win? Because that's what it really all comes down to. For even though God through Jesus has set us up to be winners, he told us he's, he, he will always cause us to triumph. He set us up to be winners in every situation. We, just like the boxer, must meet some criteria which leads us to being a winner in God's kingdom. So we also, in our spiritual battles, just like the fighter in his natural battle, 
We in our spiritual battle, and the fighter can look across the ring and see who his foe is. We can't. But we have to, so we have to, we have to really develop and, and, and nurture our, the criteria, uh, praise God, that, that is required for us to be winners in God's kingdom. Guess what? The criteria are the same thing. We just apply them differently. Uh, first criteria is passion, just as for the fighter in the natural passion, having that exceptionally strong, overwhelming and irresistible desire. That desire is so strong, it causes us to change our lifestyle, change how we live in. Uh, causes us to conduct our lives in such a way that everything we do uh, should be leading us towards that, that victory, leading us towards winning every time. Okay, so how is that passion demonstrated in the spiritual realm? Jesus said in, in Matthew, he said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, where your treasure is. In other words, that thing that you are passionate about will control and direct and guide and lead you in what you do, what you say. Even will have uh, a, a lot to do with what you think about, what you, what you pay attention to. Uh, so that's, that's one way we know. What, what, what things do I treasure? What things do I put before God? What things do I, do I get up in the morning or, 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 or have my heart in an open posture towards God? How long does it go in the course of a day after I wake up before I invite God in? Is my treasure on getting to work? What, it, what is my treasure? Only you can answer that. Okay. Now, <coughs> excuse me. The, uh, there's a scripture in... Psalms, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a scripture in Psalms, Psalms 42 and 1, and it reads wise, as the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. King David wrote this particular verse, in fact, the, that partic this particular psalm, but this verse in particular grabbed my attention. Now, here's a picture this verse could paint. You see a deer just kind of frolicking, frolicking in, the, in the forest, and he's making his way uh, down towards the stream to get something to drink. He drinks it well, to his field, and he makes his way on down wherever it is he's going. That's one picture, and it's, it's a valid picture. But here's how I see this particular verse. As a deer pants... After the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O oh God. Okay, you have this deer. You have a water brook. Anyone has watched any uh, animal or nature documentaries will know that a water brook is a, a, a dangerous place to be for an animal. A dangerous place to be. Why? Because predators know that their prey gets thirsty and will come to the, wa to the water eventually. They know this, okay? The deer knows the predator, the lion, the whatever is down at the water. He knows it. So what they do is they might go for a day, may go for two, maybe even three days without drinking anything. But now, it's, it's not a want. The water is now a need. He's passionate for this water. I got to have it. Nothing will substitute for it. Nothing will take its place. As he goes on his way now to the water, he's fully cognizant that there are predators at the water brook. There are, there's something there that wants to, wants to kill and eat me. He knows this. He's aware of this, okay? But as I said, this water is no longer just a desire. It's no longer just a want. 
It's a need. He has to have this water. So he goes and as he approaches the water, he's on the lookout. He's looking every direction and he's he's got his ears uh, up and, and on, on, on guard. And he's trying to be as safe as he can be. But he needs the water. He needs this water. Got to have this water. Nothing will take its place. So he's he's drawn by his passion, his his need for this water. And finally, he gets to the edge of the water and he throws all caution to the wind. It's almost like Esther when she had to go and see the king. He's, he, if I die, I die. I need this water. So he goes and he gets the water. You see the difference? The difference is his passion was such that he was willing to die to get the water. That's where we need to get. That's where we as children of God need to get. God is not just there for our convenience or, or there waiting uh, for us to, you know, to, to, to look him up, to, to call him up, to, to whatever it is that we think he's waiting on us for to do. God is God whether we recognize it or not. And he, we need to get, to our, get, get our hearts set to where we don't just want to be with God when it's convenient or when I want something. We want, we, it's to the point where it should be getting, we should be striving to get to the point where I recognize I need God in everything I do. I'm nothing without him. Without him, I can do nothing. I need God. I don't care if my brother doesn't agree with me. I don't care even if my spouse doesn't agree with me. I need God. So we have to be passionate, have to develop a passion for the presence of our living God. Passion. So much so I'm willing to change my lifestyle. I'm not going to go back to those places I used to go. I'm not going to hang with the people I used to hang with because they're not in sync with where I'm going. And I'm going to Jesus. So we have, de we have to develop. If we want to win every single time, I, we have to have a heart set that's completely yearning for God in every aspect of our life. We keep nothing from him. We give him all. Okay. Now, the second criteria, focus. Again, focus is uh, making uh, your goal the center of your attention, making it your priority. Uh, Jesus uh, said through the pen of Paul in Philippians, he says, let this mind be in you which is also in Christ Jesus, okay? Now, we have to train our thought process. We have to train it. We, we can't just go willy-nilly through life and, and allowing ourselves to look at everything and, and listen to everything and, and be around every situation and, and expect our minds to be open and receptive when God speaks to us. God doesn't speak to us in the whirlwind. God does not yell at us. He doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't jump up and down to get our attention. He speaks in a quiet voice. And sometimes we have so much going on in our minds that we can't hear the quiet, gentle voice of our God when he talks to us. So we have to train our minds, train our minds by not letting, just not letting ourselves be entertained by every single thing. Not, focus, not allowing ourselves to, 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 to focus on a whole bunch of different things, especially if they aren't in agreement with where you're going. How do we do that? How do we do that? He said, let this mind be in me, which is also in Christ Jesus. Is that even possible? Is my mind, can I even have the mindset of God? Well, <laughs> the answer is an obvious yes. God would not ask us to do it if it was not possible for us to do. Through the Holy Spirit, yes, we can train our mind to be one that's locked in on, the, uh, on God and the things of God. How do we do that? Again, in Philippians in, in chapter 4, God says, Finally, my brethren, <clears throat> whatsoever things 
that are just, whatsoever things that are true, whatsoever things that are honest, whatsoever things that are pure, whatsoever things that are lovely, whatsoever things that are of good report, if they have any nature, any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Think on these things. So if we train ourselves to think on the things that are of God, think on the things that please God, what we think on, we end up doing. We end up saying. So if we think on the things that are pure and true and honest and of a good report, if they have any praise, if we're thinking on those things, what I've learned over the years, we can't, that what I've learned over the years is good and evil do not coexist in the same place at the same time. It's not possible. Good will prevail if we allow it to. How do we allow it to? We think on those things that are of God, that please God. Think on God and things of God, okay? Uh, the word says it like this in Romans. He said, don't be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good. Think on good things. When you think on godly things, you end up saying godly things. You end up doing godly things. So focus, focus. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, now, the third criteria, the third criteria, we've talked about passion, we've talked about focus, now we're going to talk about preparation. We're going to use three verses, coming from the book of Psalms, Psalm 37, we're going to use verse 3, 4, and 5 to talk about equipping ourselves, preparing ourselves, making plans, training ourselves, developing that spiritual muscle memory such that when things come up, when challenges come up, when obstacles come, uh, get in our way, might even knock us and have us reeling almost to where uh, we, we, we still have the, the spiritual muscle memory that, that, that we won't fall. Even if we fall, even if we fall, we have the spiritual capacity now to get up, okay? Take that eight count. Now I'm, shake it off, and now I'm ready to go. Praise God. So, with preparation, we're going to start with uh, verse 3 in, in, in uh, the 37th Psalm. Verse 3 says, trust in the Lord and do good. So shall, well, I'll read the whole thing, 3, 4, and 5. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Praise God. So let's start with verse 3. Verse 3 says, trust in the Lord and do good. So shall you dwell in the land, and verily shalt thou be fed. Okay? Your training, here's, here's, here's the muscle, <clears throat> your spiritual development that you must work on, that you must, that you must try to develop, that, that you develop and strengthen this spiritual muscle memory, and here's the training, okay? Uh, you trust in the Lord, which means you be confident in him, you agree with him, and you rely on him. You trust in the Lord. Now, I heard my brother in the gospel on Sunday talking about trust. Minister King said, uh, he said, God, I hadn't heard it put this way before. He said, God has expectations on us. He expects us to have an active trust. In other words, he expects us to be living our lives every day and in every situation, we're relying on him. Our confidence is in him. We are not to put him on the shelf thinking or saying to ourselves, I got this. In so doing, praise God, we're saying I'm smarter than God. I'm bigger, I'm better than God. Now, he's expecting us to have this active, non-dormant ever trust in him. And when we have this active trust, here's the, here's the benefit. You now have the capacity 
to trust his word, to believe what he says, to believe his word. OK, now it's kind of like I, I look at it like this. Our if you had any exposure to children, children that you had influence over uh, when they're little, they they, they kind of sit on your every word. They they ha they trust you. They throw their hand in your hand when we cross the street automatically. They trust you. And because they trust you, when you tell them something, they receive it. Freely and completely. They receive it. So that's where we need to be trying to get to where we can trust in God. Put all of our confidence in him in every situation. OK, do good. That means to be beneficial or helpful to yourself and to others. Now, when we are doing this phase of the training, you know, in various phases of physical training, you develop certain muscles, you develop certain aptitudes for things, or certain stamina, certain conditioning. Uh, so when we develop trust, we work on trust and continuously work on trust and doing good. God says, here's what you'll win, provision, okay? And, he, and this is how he said it in this verse. He says, you will dwell in the land. In other words, you'll have a roof over your head. You'll have shelter, and you shall be fed. You'll have food to eat. So if we trust him and do good, he'll make sure we have a roof over our head. He'll make sure we'll have the necessities of life. In fact, he says it this way in Matthew 6 and 31 through 33. He says, <clears throat> therefore, do not worry saying, what shall, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. So all he's saying is, <laughs> why do we waste so much time scrambling around and putting pressure on ourselves to wear the latest fashions, to eat the finest foods, or to have the finest home. Why do we go through that when all we have to do is look to him? He knows we need things. He knows we need all those things. We're not, we're, he didn't create us to try to be, position ourselves to have the best house, drive the finest car, wear the latest fashions. That's not why he created us. He created us in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ so that we, we might be his ambassadors, that his will be done on earth through us. And if we are taking care of his business, you better believe he's going to take care of yours. So that's component number one in preparation. Component number two in preparation is to delight. Psalm 37 and 4 says, delight thyself in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Your training, what are you developing here? What spiritual uh, component are you, uh, or muscle are you developing here? What are you working on? What are you preparing? What are you getting ready? To delight, to delight, okay, to delight yourself in the Lord. What does that mean? It means to desire or to take pleasure in. Uh, we need to take pleasure in our God and being in his presence. And it's too often we make it a robotic thing. We make it to where it's the same thing, same place every day. Even the same prayer, regrettably, uh, from time to time for periods of time. God desires a relationship, he said, I, those that worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. Come to me when you're feeling good. Let, let, let's, let's feel good together. Come to me when you're not feeling so good, and I'll help you. God is wanting us to take pleasure in being in his presence, in being his child, in being his ambassador. Not someone that we can just 
treat as though he were a sugar daddy or something like that. No, come to him when I need something. No, he wants a relationship whereby we, 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 can't, we can't go without, see, without being in his presence. We are uncomfortable. It's like in the natural. You are not pleased when you're not able to be in the presence of the one that, that you love or care for, be it a spouse or a particular dear friend. You, you, you want to be with them. You want to talk to them every chance you get. That's what we need to develop and strive towards in our relationship with God. And what do you win? What, what do you win? You win favor both with God and with man. Uh, God said he would give you your wants and in addition to your needs. He would give thee. He would give thee the desires of your heart. If we have a heart that delights in God, if we love God and are striving to draw closer to him, just like in the natural, you love somebody, you are not going to ask for things or do things that offend them. You learn them so that you can do things they like. You, you learn them so, so, that, so that we can, you can, you can pro provide the things that they like, so that you can uh, strive to be one with them, okay? Same with God. He, he, wants, <clears throat> he wants us to have that kind of a relationship with him. We win his favor, and he knows if, he, if, he, if we have a heart towards him, we won't ask for things that won't please him. We won't want things that he, want, want, that he does not want us to have. Okay? So here's how God said it. Here's how God said how he would handle delighting ourselves in him. In 2 Chronicles 16 and 9, it says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. What the, wow, this is, this is a strong verse. He says, God is searching for those who have their heart yielded towards him. Why? So that he can show himself strong. Can you imagine? The maker of all heaven and all earth, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, God, King Jesus, looking for those who have a yielded heart for them so that he can show himself strong. Wow. I mean, if he's got the intellect, the wisdom, the power to do all things, and he wants to do it in such a way that he shows himself to be strong for you if your heart is yielded towards him. Whew. <laughs> that, I don't know about you, but that alone ought to, ought, to, ought to make you want to desire to be in the presence of, of the Lord, to yield your heart completely and continuously to our great God. And then in Second uh, Peter, God tells us, he says, talking about giving you the desires of your heart, guess what? He's already done it. He's already done it. He says, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him, who called us by glory and virtue. He's all, he has, that's past tense, he's already given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. All we have, well, why don't I have it? Well, maybe you're not in a position to receive it. It's there waiting for you, but guess what? You're, you don't, you're, you're in the wrong place. Your heart is not yielded. You don't, you're not focused. You don't want to change your lifestyle. You don't have enough passion to get it to change your lifestyle. Glory. Now, the third component of preparation comes from verse 5 of uh, the 37th Psalm, and it's, commit, it's, it's commitment, <clears throat> or commit, not commitment, commit. The word says it like this, commit thy ways unto the Lord, trust in him also, and he shall bring it to pass. 
Now, what's the spiritual muscle we're trying to train and develop, prepare and make ready? It's commit. Now, to commit in this context means, it says commit thy way to the Lord. It means to, literally it means to roll over. But what it really, you know, another way of saying it is to turn things over to him, to entrust him. In other words, we, we sometimes are not in a position to win because we have too much self in the, in, in the, in the formula to get there. We have too much self, our own plan, our own agenda, our own way of doing things. It's too much of us. God says, I want you to commit your ways to me. Give it to me. I care for you. Now, when we commit <coughs> to the Lord, commit our ways to the Lord. What's our ways? Our life, what we do. Here's what we win. He says, you do this and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring it to to pass. Now, <clears throat> what is it? Well, <laughs> whatever the obstacle, the challenge, the opponent, the foe you might be dealing with is an it. My it may not be your it. You might have a financial it. Someone else might have a, a health issue it. Somebody else might have a relationship it. Whatever your it is, God says, I got it. I'll bring it to pass. I'll deal with it when you commit your ways to me. I'll handle it. You don't have to try to resolve it. I got it. So here's what God says, praise God, about committing things to him. He said it in Proverbs. He says, in all thy ways, Acknowledge me, and I'll direct your path. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct <coughs> excuse me, your path. In all your ways, acknowledge him. What does it mean to acknowledge him? That means, first of all, to invite him in. Secondly, to listen to what he says about it. Thirdly, to do what he says about it. He says, if you do those things, because there'll be questions you can't answer. There'll be, there'll be situations you don't have a clue on what to do. I have the answer. I knew the end of that situation before it began. Acknowledge me, and I will direct your path. And then in Proverbs 16 and 3, God says, <coughs> excuse me, commit your works to the Lord. Commit is the same commit that we saw uh, in, in uh, 37 and 5. Roll over to turn over to God. So he says, <coughs> if we turn over to him our works, he says, your thoughts will be est established. <coughs> excuse me, sorry. Your thoughts will be established. Now, what he's saying there, if we, mm, sorry, he says, if we conduct ourselves in such a way that everything we do is done unto him, it's done as led by him, it's done to glorify him, and it's done to edify his body, if everything we do, we focus on what do you, how do you want me to do what you want me to do. Focus on it. Give it to him. You can plan. You can, you, you can try to uh, formulate uh, a strategy for the thoughts you might have. But before you do anything about it, you, you talk to him. You talk to daddy about it. Is this what you want me to do? You might be burning up inside to do it. But you can tell him. And this works all the time for me. Say, Lord, <laughs> I really want to do this. I really, really do. I believe it's a good thing. In fact, I believe it's a God thing. I want to do it. But nevertheless, not my will. Let your will be done. I don't want to do it more than I want to do what you want me to do. 
So if you don't want me to do it, take this out of my heart and, 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 and show me what you want me to do. Show me how you want me to do it, and I'll do it. So he wants us to commit. He said if we commit our works to him, guess what? He said your thoughts will be established. In other words, when you, if, if God gives you a, a task to do, you have no clue how to do it. Guess what? He'll show you how to do it. He'll tell you how to do it. He'll lead you step by step. You take the first step. I don't know what the first step, first step is. Well, just do what I tell you to do. And, and, and I got it from there. Okay? So that's where we are. That's where we are. We want to posture ourselves in such a way that we are passionate about our relationship with God. So much so, I'm willing to change my lifestyle. I'm willing to let go of the things I used to like doing. I don't care that they were sinful or not. You don't, they don't help me get closer to you. So I'm not going to do them anymore. Those people I like to hang out with, no more. Not going to do it. Then if we stay focused, make drawing closer to King Jesus our priority. Remember, we always have, thing, have time to do those things that are priority for us. And then <clears throat> we prepare. We get ready. We condition ourselves. We develop our spiritual muscle memory by committing, by, com by rolling over all of, our, all of our works to him. We, we also... Uh, praise the name of the Lord, delight ourselves in him. And first and foremost, we trust in him. Now, as I close, I just want you to know. Victory, you, you do these things, you will win every single time. I, no, I don't guarantee it. Jesus did. He says, I will always cause you to triumph in me. OK, so God knows how to bring things to an expected, his expected end. And you know this, his expected end is, 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 is good. It's, it's not evil towards us. It's good. It's a good expected end towards us. So just because it doesn't look like victory, doesn't feel like victory, hang in there. And know that you know that if you are passionate, focused, and prepared, God said he will always, not just when he feels like it, but always cause us to triumph. Well, I hope something was said that would help us this evening. I want us to know that we can win every single time we can win we are overcomers christ overcame the world we in him are overcomers well i'm gonna close god has stopped talking so i will too but before we close i, I just want to want us to draw our minds in and i just want to pray just for a moment that we all that we all come to realize that if God be for us who I mean who can be against us he's greater than the whole world against us we win we can win when we posture ourselves to win the boxer that walks in the ring He's walked in after much training, much preparing, much focusing. They go to training camp all by themselves and work out for weeks and months at a time. We need to do no less. We need to prepare ourselves to focus, to prepare. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, I thank you for allowing us, oh God, to sit at your feet this evening. I'm asking you, my King, to continue your hand ever stayed, O oh God. 
upon Pastor Sam, Pastor Gloria. I'm asking you to continue your hand ever state upon the works you've given Mount Olive Church of Plano and the, and the uniting in the bodies of Christ churches. I'm asking you, oh God, to move, oh God, in a special way on those who have been negatively affected by this COVID and any other maladies that might have uh, disrupted their body. I'm asking you, oh God, to just continue your hand ever stayed upon us in such a way that we know, we know we have a work to do, but it, and no matter how challenging, how difficult it might be, we can win every single time in you. Bless us to be in you. Bless us to stay in you for our own good and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good night. God bless.